Yay, more tubes of you Snapple facts for VU. You. Sorry, the preschool teacher and me couldn't resist the rhyme, so. <laughs> I just loved making my last video so much, a little too much, if I'm honest, that I thought I'd help you be even more mediocrely interesting at your next social gathering by sharing even more things. I wish I'd known as a new Christian. If you missed the very average part one, you can find it in the description. Number one, people do not become angels, no matter what my very adorable and lovely Mormon friends say. There is not one Bible verse to support this, but seems to be pretty popular in some circles, even outside the Mormon church. Angels are separate creations of God with a very specific purpose. You must go outside the Bible to believe this, in other words. I used to think that when I died, I would be able to choose what form of spiritual being I would become. An angel, a cherubim, a unicorn. And that was more of my bad interpretation and imagination than it was something taught in the Bible. Number two, speaking of cherubim, these are not cute, tiny little chubby baby angels. I do not know how or when or why someone decided that cherubim were chubby babies with wings, but the Bible depicts them as something much scarier than a newborn. The cherubim, along with the seraphim, seem to be the highest rank of heavenly beings. And a bonus fact for you, in Ezekiel 28, though it can be an interesting time interpreting it, it states that prior to Satan's rebellion, he was not an angel, but a cherubim. Number three, this is actually a brand new one to me, but envision Eve in the garden about to take down mankind. Thank you for that. She eats from the fruit, which is not an apple. See part one. Is she alone though? Is she by herself? This one actually ruffles some feathers, but surprisingly, it's actually widely believed by many credible scholars that Adam was with Eve the whole time when she ate the fruit. Now, the reason why some people believe this is because in Genesis 3, it says that when she took of the fruit and ate, she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. The phrase, who was with her, in traditional Jewish interpretation, takes this phrase to mean that Adam was with Eve the whole time that she was being tempted and that he heard the whole conversation. It would also help explain the sin of Adam mentioned in the New Testament. Now, just full disclosure here, I don't know if I know enough about this perspective to agree or disagree with this because I haven't actually looked into it myself. But I thought it was an interesting enough fact to mention that not everyone believes that Eve was alone. Number four, speaking of Adam, this was just my own brain braining kind of well one day. It does that sometimes. But I was thinking to myself that logically, Adam probably most likely had long hair. Almost every depiction of Adam and Eve in the garden shows him with short hair, but I just don't simply see how that would be consistent with an ancient man in the middle of ancient Iran with no scissors or cultural parameters. Number five, since we're in the book of Genesis, imagine the story of Cain and Abel. Abel, the righteous son, gives an offering to God that's pleasing, while Cain gives a subpar offering. He gets so mad at Abel over this that he kills him with a rock. Right? Well, would you be surprised to know that that is not what it says? It simply says that Cain attacked and killed Abel. The Bible never says how Cain killed Abel. So, hmm, where does this popular belief come from if not from scripture? Most likely it comes from tradition or from the uninspired book of Jasher. There is a book of Jasher mentioned in the Bible that was a collection of Psalms and poems. And there was also an 18th century forgery of the book of Jasher as well. Either way, scripture itself doesn't specify how Cain killed Abel, just that he did kill Abel. Sorry to ruin a bunch of memes out there. <laughs> Number six, the Bible never says to just have blind faith. One thing that absolutely drove me into looking at other new age spiritual books for answers was I used to think that most Christians didn't value critical thinking and just blindly believed 
with no evidence. I learned that some Christians aren't always the best representatives for Christianity because the Bible encourages rational exploration and reasonable examination. Believers are repeatedly encouraged throughout scripture to examine what we believe carefully so that we can be fully convinced of our beliefs and that they are true. Hashtag critical thinking win. Number seven, there was no little drummer boy at Jesus's birth. Sorry. Number eight, okay, I used to be so confused with the common names in the Bible, like James, Mary, and John, just to name three. It's like the modern day equivalent to John, Chris, and Mike. I guarantee you that 95% of you, if not all of you, know at least like two or three John, Chris's, or Mike's. So fun FYI for you, the author of the gospel is John, is not John the Baptist, but the disciple John. The woman at Jesus' feet was not Mary Magdalene, but Mary, Martha's sister. The author of the book of James was not the disciple James, but Jesus' brother James. Just thought you should know. <laughs> Number nine, God does not speak in a still small voice. I know this one's really popular in a lot of churches, on a lot of like Facebook memes. I was told by more than a few Christians when I was a new Christian that when I was going through anything that I'd need to stop and really listen for God's still small voice to get direction. Guys, let me tell you something. This sounds good on the surface, but it's frustrating. It's like as if that's the only way that God speaks. Imagine my surprise that this is only mentioned once in scripture with Elijah in 1 Kings, but most other places God is a speaking pretty intensely. <laughs> Through a whirlwind, an earthquake, like thunder, those depictions are way more numerous than God speaking in a still small voice. And of course, we can discern God's direction through the Bible. So why would God only speak in a still small voice? And let's be real, a lot of times it's just our thoughts that are coming into our brain, trying to brain and give us direction. And we don't really know it until after the fact when we've messed everything up thinking it was God telling us to do something, am I right? Also, here's an extra toy in your happy meal of information today. But God is not an equal or exact opposite to Satan. I remember thinking that how good God was was equated to how evil Satan was. That's not how God reveals himself and is ultimately superior to Satan. I made a whole video on God's attributes and I elaborate on this. If you wanna check it out, it'll be in the description. Number 10, the seven deadly sins. These are not specifically listed in the Bible. The seven deadly sins are pride, envy, gluttony, lust, anger, greed, and sloth, which is like laziness. And to be very clear and fair, they are definitely sins that are condemned in the Bible, but it's not like a specific list saying, these are the seven deadly sins and woe to you if you commit them because they lead to unforgivable mortal sins or something. No. The closest thing we have to a sort of list is in Proverbs 6, which says there are seven things that are detestable to God. First, haughty eyes, two, a lying tongue, three, hands that shed innocent blood, four, a heart that plots evil, five, feet that are quick to rush to do wrong, six, a false witness, and seven, a man who stirs up dissension among his brothers. Also, another popcorn fact for you. <laughs> Remember that show, Pop Quiz, back in the 90s? No? Just me? There is only one unforgivable sin, according to scripture, and it's not any of these. It's blasphemy of the spirit, and I made a video about that subject a while ago explaining what that is. If you'd like to check it out and become 1.3% smarter, I'll put it up here somewhere. I don't know. And also in the description for you to check out. Number 11, Jesus spoke Aramaic. And I can't believe I even have to say this, but he didn't speak English either. Number 12, okay, this one will need some explanation, <laughs> but unicorns are not in the Bible. For some context, I've mentioned this a few times on my channel before, but when I first became a Christian, I was a King James onlyist. This can mean a few different things, but for me, I saw the King James version as superior to other translations, and other translations were demonized and new age. In the King James specifically, it mentions the word unicorn several times in the Old Testament, and you guys, I am embarrassed to say that I ran with this. 
There was a brief period of time that I believed unicorns were real because of this. I mean, come to find out, the original Hebrew word basically means beast with a horn. Not a mythical creature. Number 13, what heaven is like. Now imagine heaven. Do you see a lot of white? Some clouds, maybe? Maybe little baby angels flying around with harps. People are all in white playing harps themselves, and it's like one big, long church service. No, that's just... We won't be floating around on clouds, playing harps, or any of that stuff. The Bible is actually quite silent about certain aspects of heaven, but what we do know is that it's not that. <laughs> we will be in the presence of our creator once again, and it will not be boring. <laughs> Speaking of imagining things, number 14, imagine the devil, Satan. See what he looks like? Maybe holding a pitchfork with red skin, horns perhaps, hoofs for feet. Some of you already know what I'm getting at. Does he have a pointy tail? A lot of people think that the devil looks like a monster, and he might in some aspects, but the Bible actually describes him in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 as an angel of light. In Ezekiel, he's described as one of God's most beautiful creations. How about that? The problem here is that Satan is a spirit and he's a non-physical being. So it's hard to attribute physical characteristics to him. And this is one reason why scripture doesn't describe him physically, but emphasizes his deception. Now let's just say that Satan were to manifest physically. He would not show up with a pointy tail and a pitchfork. He would show up as a coexistaker, a peacemaker, a pastor even. He'd come to deceive and he'd masquerade as a false truth. Number 15, ever heard that money is the root of all evil? Yeah, me too. Too bad it's wrong. <laughs> money is not the root of all evil. See, this is what happens when the tiniest of changes are made to scripture and you end up with a very problematic interpretation that people can abuse. The scripture in question is in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, and it says, The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. This matters, y'all. Misquoting a scripture and making a blanket statement that wealth is the root of all evil can lead to some pretty irrational justification by a certain society in love with cancel culture with a hatred for a certain demographic of people based only on the fact that they're wealthy. First of all, money is not the root of all evil. Sin is. Second, the idol of money, the love of money, is what brings all kinds of evil, which means money is not evil, but the kind of evil it brings can vary. But this is not the cause of all evil. Now granted, Jesus still warns about wealth being an obstacle to accepting him as it says in Matthew 19, but he still emphasizes that they are redeemable. Number 16, cleanliness is next to godliness is not in the Bible. And I have to be honest, I didn't even know what this meant. <laughs> I mean, I've heard it in pop culture for so long and I think that's why people think it comes from the Bible. But it means that it is almost as important to be clean and pure as it is to be good because then you're closer to God if you're like this. But yeah, no, that's nowhere in the Bible. Speaking of things that are not in the Bible, 17. God won't give you more than you can handle is not in the Bible. I think people quote it like it is, but it is not. Number 18, more people than just the 12 disciples followed Jesus. There were always 12 apostles who had a unique authority, but a disciple is simply someone who follows Jesus. This is shown all throughout the New Testament that many people were called disciples, but only the 12 were apostles. This can be very confusing because the term is used interchangeably to address the 12 disciples, and other times to address disciples in general. One example is laid out in Luke 14, where Jesus is telling everyone the cost of being his disciple, and earlier on in Luke 10, when he sends out the 70 disciples. This is also seen in Matthew 5, with the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus was sitting on the mountainside and describes that his disciples, his followers, came to him 
So he speaks to them as a crowd. Ooh, we're to number 19. Those of you that have stuck with me this long, thank you for putting up with my face and my voice. I appreciate it. <laughs> number 19, speaking of disciples, do you know how many times the word Christian appears in the Bible? Don't Google it. No, put down your phone. Don't exit out of this video. For those of you who aren't cheater bedeaters, it's three, three times, twice in Acts and once in first Peter. It was actually a derogatory term at the time, but eventually became adopted as identifying as someone who followed Jesus. Apparently in the year 2020, it could mean just about anything. <laughs> Last but not least, 20. Job is pronounced with a long O sound. It is not pronounced job. Come on, man. More than one of you had to have done that when you first saw the name in the Bible. Am I right? <sighs> okay, my lovely tubes of you land watchers out there. Thank you for, you know, tuning in with your potatoes and your snacks. <laughs> Hopefully you are a 3.5 potato and a half smarter now. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. For more content, you can follow me on the Book of Face and the Gram of Insta.